Welcome to the We as Citizens podcast. Here is your host, Christina Crowley. Today, I would like to welcome Doug Lauks to the program. Doug is a former CIA operations officer. He served in the Middle East. He was in Afghanistan for the 2010 Afghan surge and in Kandahar during Operation Neptune Spear, which resulted in the death of Osama bin Laden. You may recognize him from one of the television shows that he's appeared in, including Discovery Channel's Finding Escobar's Millions, and more recently, Bravo's Spy Games. And he is the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Left a Boom, How a Young CIA Case Officer Penetrated the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Welcome to the show, Doug. Thank you for being here. Hey, Christina. I really appreciate you having me. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. And so I read the book. It's an excellent book. And this book is, it's not so much a book about war or the inner workings of the CIA. You tell us what you can, but it's a really good civics lesson for people like myself who've never served in any way. And so I just want to talk a little bit at first. It seemed to me that you grew up a typical teen in Indiana. You had fun with your friends and you were close to your grandmother and you had a job. You did all the typical things of high school life. And then the year 2001 came along and it seemed like that was a really life-changing year for you. Yeah, well, obviously 2001, when it hits September, is life-changing for everyone, for the whole world. Uh, Yeah, I, I started college, would have been uh, September like 1st of mm-hmm. 2001. So I had only been in college 10 days and then 9-11 happens. And um, for anybody who was in a university at that time, it flipped the way universities did business too. Because if you think that the TSA has like changed the way airport security is, well, yeah, well, guess what? Security on campus flipped too. Like it was very lax for those 10 days. And yeah. I had visited my brother on his campus many, many times, almost no security at all, you know? Mm-hmm. And then, I mean, geez, I went to Indiana University. So, you know, it's not like it's downtown at Columbia University in New York, but there were armed police officers with like M16s walking around campus for the next like six months. It was a really big deal. And yeah. people often forget how scared we all were at that time and we never knew what was going to come next so that was definitely a trip to start college out uh-huh. with uh, with guys with you know automatic rifles walking around so yes definitely life-changing and up until that point in college which was only a few weeks you were on the path to be a doctor and when 9-11 happened you wrote in the book that you you changed that path you went and changed your major to political science. Yeah, I did. Um, so, and most folks know this, like when you graduate high school, you then usually have to go down or wherever to the university that you chose and meet with like a guidance counselor in person for like three days. Uh, and then you take a tour, you get a guided tour. At least this was my experience and mm-hmm. a lot of my friends. And then you pick your major. And so you would have had to have done some research prior to that. And so for me, I had been like an intern in high school at the local optometrist, and I liked that. And so I decided, you know, I'm going to do this. This guy makes good money. He's got a nice car. It's not gory. You know, I don't have to perform serious surgery, you know, Uh like a cardiothoracic surgery or something. So, um, yeah, that was my plan. And... Yeah, after 9-11, probably by October 1st, I had switched my major because, you know, we were all glued to the television set. Mm -hmm. And as embarrassing as this is then, though, if people are honest, they probably were in the same boat as me. I did not know who Osama bin Laden was Uh as of 9-11. And I don't think most people did. No, Uh, nobody did. Even though he was responsible for the 1998 Kobar Tower bombings. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that what Al Qaeda was and that was in Mm -hmm. Africa. So no one really cared. And, you know, so like, yeah, okay. That was a bombing, you know, so what USS Cole. Yeah. That happened in the middle East. Like, yeah, okay. It's a 
U.S. naval ship. That sucks, but okay. Mm -hmm. But I did not know who UBO was, and that bothered me. It really bothered me that it, like I didn't know who our biggest enemy was, a guy who really hated us and who did this to us. So I decided, yeah, yeah this is too much. Like the world's changed. You're not going to be an eye doctor no more. You're you're going into some sort of government work or something, or you're joining the military or or mm -hmm. something. So. Yeah, definitely changed my trajectory, changed my life. Yeah, as it did everybody, like you said. And, mm -hmm. and, it, and it wasn't unheard of for people not to know who he was, and neither did I. I didn't know who Osama bin Laden was until that day. Mm -hmm. And uh, But you got through college, you got through your four years, you studied uh, political science and East Asian studies, Correct. with focus on the Japanese language. Yes. And like most uh, kids that age were getting out of, college you you apply to a whole lot of different positions and as i read you applied to many government agencies but it was the cia who you saw the ad for in a school newspaper that called you back yeah that's correct uh i had applied to cia nsa fbi all of those alphabet soup uh, uh -huh. agencies and my thought was you know, the chance of a guy like me getting accepted into any of those is slim to none. But because of that, why not? You know, there's no application fee, like applying to grad school or something like that. So I was like, I can do it from my, you know, bedroom on my computer. So why not? You know, I'll fill out all their paperwork. And uh, the CIA called me like five days later after I pushed send. And I was in total shock. And uh, so, yeah, it kind of spiraled from there. And then, you know, I went to all the various meetings and took all the tests and the fun polygraphs and all of that. And I guess they liked what I had to say <laughs> and yeah. I made it through. So, yeah, that's, um, that's the ticket. And, you know, I've said this many times, a lot of people think that to get into the CIA, uh, it's like in the movies, somebody comes up to you in a dark alleyway and says, hey, I'm recruiting you for the CIA. That does not happen ever. They don't. Uh, they, you have to apply online. It is the only way to get into the CIA. And I always tell college seniors that like, this is the only way to get in. So um, take that for what it's worth if you're a listener and you're interested in joining. No one's going to come up to you in a bar and, uh, you know, pass you a, a piece of paper recruiting you. So apply online. But it was quite a rigorous process as you wrote about in the book oh, yeah. for you to uh, be approved for hire. Oh, yeah. Uh, it took a long time. Uh, so like what was the hardest and what took the longest for me is if they really actually do like you, meaning like they want to hire you, well, they then, you fill out what's called an SF-86, which is mm -hmm. uh, standard form 86, which is what you have to do to get a top secret clearance. Well, if you're working at the CIA, that's the minimum clearance you're going to get is a top secret. So you have to have it and they have to know you're able to get it before they're going to offer you a conditional offer of employment. Yeah. So when you fill that out, for anybody who has filled it out, you know how arduous it is. But uh, it's, you know, like 40 pages and you have to list uh, everywhere you live for the past like 12 years. And when you're in college, you live somewhere new every single year, oh, you yeah. know? And then uh, I had moved like five times in five years. And then they wanna know your high school principal's name and they wanna go to speak to your English teacher, you know? And they want to speak to all of your neighbors and all of your friends from high school. And so they, <laughs> They have to go do that. Well, the problem with that is uh, living where I was from in Indiana, it's not anywhere close to where a, a field office would be for a federal investigator to go conduct those interviews. Mm -hmm. So if I had lived in Chicago or Los Angeles or Miami or New York, well, they have a field office right downtown. So they <laughs> can take the train and be there in 10 minutes and conduct all the interviews. Here, they had to drive out to like dairy farms and, you know, interview these farmers that I had lived next to. So, you know, and to get a hold of them took five tries. So mm -hmm. my, my, uh, 
hiring process took a very long time uh, for them to check all of the mandatory boxes that are required before they can grant you a top secret clearance. And that was only the beginning because once they say, yeah, he's eligible, then you go and try to do it, you know? So then you start taking the battery of tests, then they feel comfortable enough, you know, administering these different, you know, uh, tests and polygraphs and interviews and all of that only after they know you're even eligible. So it takes a very long time yeah. if you're not living in a big city. Uh huh. Uh, it seemed like it went from reading through the book. And so you got through the process, you jumped through all the hoops. And I think when most people think of a government job, they think of, oh, processes. And, and yeah. that's understandable. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but when you, when you got to your job, I, I take it it's in, it's in Washington, D.C., of course. And yes. you moved there from where you were working mm-hmm. in Colorado at the time. And when you get there, now, this is where I'm kind of unclear. And I need to ask you, did you, did you have someone show you around? Did you have someone show you the mm-hmm. ropes? Did you have someone um, say, this is your career, how it's going to go? Well, uh, I will tell you that, so the, this, is, this is on Wikipedia, so I'm not giving anything away. The CIA headquarters, they call it Langley, uh, is in McLean, Virginia. I, I mean, everyone knows that. Like, you can look it up, so I'm not mm-hmm. giving anything away, which is just a stone's throw away from where I lived, which was Georgetown, Washington, uh-huh. D.C., by the university, Georgetown University. And uh, so they had uh, set me up with like one of those relocation services, you know, that are like, it's a company, a legitimate company, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. that is, that helps out anybody, you know, they help out pilots, they help out anybody, you know, uh, salespeople. But uh, the problem with it is uh, they of course didn't know where I was, would be employed, but they kept showing me all of these, um, like mammoth uh, complexes, apartment complexes, all like way out in Virginia, like in, you know, uh, out by the airport, out by like Dulles. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I don't, there's nothing out here, you know, except this big apartment complex and a Costco. And like, I was, I think 24 at the time, 23. Mm -hmm. So I was like, there's no nightlife. There's nothing. There's, and you saw from the book, I like to have fun. Yeah. And of so I was a single 20, age does. Yeah, I'm a single 23 year old guy. Yes, I know I'm going into the CIA, but I'm also going into field work. I'm not an analyst, I'm not a nerd, you know? So yeah. I wanted to still go to bars and meet people and have friends. And I knew no one out there, no one. And so this company like set me up. <laughs> they probably hate me. I hope they're listening. <laughs> they set up like they set up like 10 uh tours oh, of these big complexes i took yeah. one and i was like i would jump off of the roof of this place if i lived here i'm thinking to myself <laughs> like this is misery who are these people who live out here oh my god and so um I didn't go to the next nine <laughs> and I didn't know how to cancel them. So I just didn't show up. Yeah. Uh, and so I just drove into Washington, DC and just from driving around and I parked my car and walked around and I was like, okay, this, I've heard of this place called Georgetown. Like that's the only area of DC I had heard of. Like I didn't know about Tenley town and, you know, uh, 14th Street Corridor and Adams Morgan, yeah. which of course I know now all those areas. I didn't know the Union Station. I had never been to Washington, D.C. in my life. And I went and saw the monuments and I was like, okay, there's no housing around there. So I picked Georgetown, kind of also on a caprice, which I'm sure you've figured out is kind of how I yeah. live my life. And uh, yeah, I just, I found a... Uh, a cool like row house there's a lot of row houses there yeah they're old yeah. you know mm-hmm. from the 17 1800s lots of history yeah and I, I just liked it and um back then now it's all like shopping but back then most of the restaurants and bars were there and i was like oh well this is perfect because it's directly across the water the potomac river from the agency i can get there in five minutes in my car 
And then when I get home, I can park and I can walk to any restaurant I want because mm-hmm. I don't like to cook. Yeah. So it just made perfect sense for me. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of how I determined where I was going to live. But I'll tell you, no, no one held my hand. No one showed me around. And I would also tell you that even though I look at what my rent was then now, and I'm like, that was pretty cheap. But in Colorado, when I was living there, I think my rent was like, I don't know, $500 a month. So that was, you know, not bad. And I get to Georgetown and it's like $2,000 a month. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, whoa, that is going to be three quarters of my salary, you know, because you're a government employee. Yeah. You don't yeah. make anything. So, uh, but I was like, you know what, whatever. I'm a young guy. What do I need the money? You know, I'm just going to spend it on some food and some beer anyway. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I had sticker shock, but I was like, guess what? I only saved like $200 to go live out by the Dulles airport yeah. and be bored. So I'll do it. <laughs> so that's how I chose it. Well, that's kind of, well, that's kind of fun. But was that also you at that time were probably discovering what I interpreted from the book is there's probably two kinds of people who are in the CIA. There's people like yourself who are young, have fun, want to party. And then there's the other kind of CIA agents who are, you said, have, are mostly Mormon, have uh-huh. done a, uh, oh gosh, and no, I've forgotten the word, where they travel overseas. And so it seemed like there were their like mission. two kinds. Their mission, yes, thank you. Mm-hmm. And, and so if there's nobody kind of to show you the ropes and you're learning that kind of the hard way of you realize then that your chances of getting going to the farm were kind of slim to none for quite a while. Now that was blacked out of the book for how long you had to mm-hmm. be working there. And so once you discovered that you just did your thing and then the, how you got to the farm, I think was an interesting story is by covering your, your boss's ass. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so you're right about there being two types of people there. Although it's not 50-50, uh, I would say that it's about 90-10 to 95-5. Mm-hmm. Um, 95-5 probably is better um, of people who keep their nose entirely clean. Because you have to keep in mind, and this is something I actually spoke to a congressperson about once. Uh, like, hey, if you ever want to, you know, make some serious changes in the agency, the easiest way to do it is this, boom. Uh, So you have to keep in mind, you had to have lived a very clean life to even get into the CIA, meaning you can never have broken the law ever. You can never have done drugs ever. So right there, you just took out at the knees just about every single, you know, very outgoing person. You see Mm -hmm. what I mean? Like. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to find somebody who went to a four-year state university who didn't smoke a little bit of pot, you yeah. know, or, or, you know, get a little bit too drunk and break something and get a misdemeanor violation, you know, nothing uh-huh. serious, you yeah. know, they broke a window, ah, oh, shit, you know, he was drunk. Um, so that, that rule, you, you cannot apply now, like you're done. So the only people who can get in are very studious usually. Um, I think I just had my head screwed on right because my dad was military and he was hardcore. So I understood discipline and I understood pushing it to the limit, getting your toes to the line and then stopping, not going over it, you know? So like, uh, I had as much fun as what I knew was possible. Then I quit, you know, I didn't go past that. And because of that, really because of that, I was able to even get in to the CIA because uh, um, you had to have a really clean record, Mm -hmm. nothing bad. So unfortunately, I think that keeps out a lot of outgoing people who would be excellent case officers, excellent spies, you know, risk takers. Anyway, to that story of my boss, yeah, um, he, uh, he was supposed to basically have a report done and he didn't do it. it was a pretty important report. And I had seen it, like you can see 
uh, your boss's cue. Like mm -hmm. I can see, like I could look into, like he could look into mine and that which he wanted me to be able to see, he would let me see, you see. So like from my computer, I could look at like his cabinet and like see like what cables, we call them cables, basically files, like what documents, like a Google Drive, for example, okay? Uh -huh. So like I could look in his version of like Google Drive and see what he had allowed me access to see that he was working on. And so I saw that he was working on this one. I can't tell you what it was, but mm -hmm. it was this one important document for this country about these certain types of people. Uh -huh. And so because I was light on my workload, I started looking up these people's names and like, you know, writing profiles of these people. And my thought was, you know, this would get me a, you know, a golden star sticker, you know, like mm -hmm. boss, uh, <laughs> this guy, this chief uh, liked me for doing this. I had no intention of like turning it in that day. Well, his boss came into the office and he came in from like an overseas country and he was in a bad mood. And uh, he goes into my direct chief's, chief's office and he's like, hey, did you do that one uh, uh, file that I asked you to have completed on XYZ? And he's like, oh, um, and he's like, yeah, print it off right now. And my chief is like, I, uh, um, well, uh, yeah, okay, I'll get it to you shortly. And then uh, he comes into like my area and I had already heard it. And so he's like, hey, I need you to do this right now. And I was like, I'm already working on it, chief. And so uh, I had it done like in an hour or two. And then I walked it over to him and discreetly. And then he acted like he did it. Mm -hmm. And so then he went over to his boss, who's this big fish in the CIA. He, the guy might be one of the top floor dudes now. And then he handed it to him like he had done it. And then the guy read it right in front of him. And he's like, oh, this is excellent. Good work. <laughs> and so then he got accolades, you know, from his guy. And then when his his boss leaves, he's just like, I'm taking this with me. All right, good job. Excellent. Excellent work as always. And he he leaves and then the guy's like sweating bullets and he comes over to me and he's like, hey, that's pretty awesome. You know, and then <laughs> as luck would have it, and you know, luck plays a big part in everyone's life. Yeah. Um uh, that guy, my chief ended up becoming like the director of the farm oh. uh, like who got to go down there uh -huh. and so he remembered me and so when he saw my name was on the list he put me at the top of it and so yeah I got to go down finally so luck would have yeah. it <laughs> that I got to go but I guess you make your own luck you know sure. I had taken the initiative to do that you know yeah. to be prepared so some of it was by my own hand, but the other was certainly luck that he ended up being the director. So that was pretty cool. And in, in the stories that you talk about before you go to the farm, it seems like you really had to take responsibility for your own learning, for what you yeah, wanted you, to learn. Yeah, you know, you really do. And, um, you know, when I, the first probably two weeks I was there, uh, gee whiz, um, I, nobody, I kind of just sat at my desk and kind of just looked around like, holy crap, one, I can't believe I'm here. And two, there, there is no like one person to be like, hey, I'm your mentor or mm -hmm. anything like that. It's just, they throw you in to, you know, to help out people who are working on specific countries and you get assigned to like a desk and they say, okay, you're going to help out with country X now. You're going to help them and you're going to do whatever they ask you to do. And you kind of just are on standby until somebody, and then somebody would tell you to do something. And you're like, like, they might say like, Hey, uh, we need to uh, put a trace on that phone number. And you're like, okay, got it. How do I put a trace on a phone number? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, how do I do that, sir? Mm -hmm. And then he's, and then, you know, you're going to have the guy go, Oh my God, I got to show you how to do that. And I, and I would always say, sir, if you show me one time, you will never have to show me again. That was like my motto. Like I said that 400 times as a trainee. Sir, if you show me one time, you will never have to show me again. And they didn't because I paid real close attention. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, that is, you do have to kind of learn on your own. 
So it sounds like a, a typical job in that you're going to have to learn things on your own. Uh, yeah. You know, you're going to have to take responsibility for your own learning. Uh, but it, it's not this, I don't know what, what I expected before reading this book. I guess I expected it to be a little more form. I guess I expected it to be more like military, where there is this process, that process, and the next, and you, you learn that way. Uh, maybe the military is different, but maybe my ideas of the military are wrong too. Well, the thing is, and again, like I said, I only talk about things that are already in the public eye. Uh -huh. The CIA tells you on their website, CIA.gov, they tell you what the training is. They tell you, like, it, you're, you're going to either be a professional trainee or a uh, clandestine services trainee. So you're a PT or a CST. CST are for older people with more experience. PT is usually for people who come out of college. I was a PT. Uh -huh. And they tell you how long it's going to be, you know? So you, it shouldn't come as a surprise. It tells you how many months and what you're going to learn. But unfortunately, we have movies like The Recruit with Colin oh. Farrell and Al Pacino, where yeah. his first day at the agency, he gets on a bus and goes to the farm. Yeah. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> You mean several years later? Is that what you mean? You know, like he just, boom, he's at the farm. And it's like, oh my God, I wish. Like, yeah, right, dude. So, um, but yeah, so there's a lot of that misconception or anything you see on yeah. Homeland, you know, carry <laughs> the bane of my existence. Um, but like everything she does, you know, and like, I'll see her like, talking on her cell phone at her desk and I'm like there are no cell phones in the agency you know like going nuts like what is she doing arrest her <laughs> you know so but it's just a lot of classic you know just silly information that makes for a better show and I have no problem with that as long as the public realizes that it's entertainment purposes not reality sure and I think we kind of are we're going that way. <laughs> I hope <laughs> you talked a little bit about what you did at the farm and you couldn't talk about much mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. than I remember, and this is what shocked me too. And that it's, and maybe it's the two kinds of people when you had the bag of oranges and the six foot uh -huh. plus, yeah. Yeah. you know, crack at it coming at you and kind mm -hmm. of getting in trouble for that rather than good job because it wouldn't you know, so I, I there is that kind of where those of us who are civilians I guess that's what I'll call myself a civilian who would think sure. they would expect that to be a good thing because you kind of I don't know you covered it up so there were I, and I think the good thing about your book is you you say a lot of good things about the CIA and you say a lot of things that just don't make sense that that are like typical jobs that aren't necessarily good right yeah I mean you know, the interesting thing is I have people who have called me out on both sides and I just find that amusing in that some people will say, oh, he's stumping for the CIA. What a stooge. He's a plant. They probably are paying him. And I'm like, read my book. Okay. Like I'm pretty hypercritical, but then I have people on the other side of the spectrum who are these ultimate warriors who to say anything critical of the you know, military intelligence apparatus means you're a terrorist yeah. and they hate me. And they're like, oh, well, why don't you just take another dump all over the agency, you big crybaby? Clearly you couldn't cut it. And I'm like, uh, I don't know, look at some of my YouTube videos. I say a hell of a lot of nice things about yeah. the agency and what an honor it was to serve there and how smart they made me and how much of a better human they made me and blah, blah, blah. So yeah. I guess I deserve it because I do play both cards, um, but I just find it humorous when some people just only want to pull one of those cards and forget yeah. that I played both of them, you know, yeah. so, but uh, I have learned to deal with it over the past four years. I th kind of think that's life too, you know, sure. <laughs> in, in, yeah. in, in, all, in all respects of what you said there, you're damned mm -hmm. if you do, you're damned if you don't. But uh, what I want to talk about next is when I read this, I was like, no, he didn't. Mm -hmm. And that's when you wrote about your list of preferences upon graduating from the <laughs> farm. <laughs> yes, I did. And, and I read through that. And then, and what I want to say is, gosh, we, you know, if you've read it, we all wish we had the moxie to play your mm -hmm. hand with a person of power to get what you want. And then we yeah. wish we all took it. 
And mm -hmm. so explain a little bit about that. Cause I think you, you probably tell the story much better than me. Uh, uh, well, look, it's like this. I know that this story I'm about to tell makes me sound very bratty, very childish, but the reality is I looked at it, gosh, it will sound really bratty, but I'll say it anyway. Not with a sense of entitlement, but I looked at it as, hey, y'all, I put in a hell of a lot of my own soul for the past X amount of years to get this Willy Wonka ticket, which is passing the farm. Because mm -hmm. once you graduate from the farm, it's like graduating buds as a Navy SEAL. You did it. You're always forever a SEAL now, right? Like forever, for life, you are a Navy SEAL. And you can go do other things in the Navy if you want, but you'll always have those credentials. So for me, I would always be a case officer. I could go be an analyst, but I always would be able to recruit assets in the field because I proved I could do it at the farm. And so again, forgive me listeners. <laughs> um, my mindset was very much with bravado of, look, you guys owe this to me in so much that I am asking to go to the places that every other officer is asking not to be sent to. The very fact that I am begging you to send me to the most dangerous places and every other officer is enclosing a letter talking about how they have a newborn baby, how they just got married, how they have a sick parent, every excuse they can come up with to not be sent to a war zone. And I am begging you the exact opposite. And the fact that you're not going to take me up on that and you're going to just be dumb and send the guy who has the new baby, why? He just mm -hmm. asked you not to, and I'm begging you to. So like, why can't you just do the simple math and put me in that slot and send, you know, and they just, they don't care. This HR person just did not care. Her motto was I'm in charge. Mm -hmm. And she would be the equivalent in the military of like a general. Keep that in mind. Yeah. So that somebody super high <laughs> ranking, I would have been the equivalent of a lieutenant. All right. So it's uh, like five rungs higher. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that means about 25 years more experience. And so she just didn't give a damn. And her thought, I don't know, maybe she just did it by alphabetical. I don't know. But she was assigning a lot of my friends who really did not want to go to the war zone to war zones and they were devastated and so when I got my paperwork and um I think it said Baghdad or something like that That's what the book says, like, yeah. yeah I think it was Baghdad god that was a long time ago um but it was said Baghdad and I was like no it is not and so I marched in there and uh <laughs> I think I was wearing like a t-shirt and jeans which you don't do that in the CIA and you don't do that in the FBI. Like you wear a suit and tie. Everyone mm -hmm. in that building wears a suit and tie. Trust me. You, you will, you will turn heads if you're wearing jeans and a t-shirt. Like people are going to be like, Whoa, is he quitting today? Like, <laughs> Watch out for that guy. He might shoot up the place. So yeah, I stormed into her office and just told her, yeah, this is not happening. And we got in a big argument, which I talked about in the book uh -huh. and um, threatened to quit. And the reason is, and again, I know I sound like a big baby, but what I knew was this. A, like I said, I wanted to go where nobody else wanted to go. So just please do the simple things. But B, they had spent millions of dollars in training me alone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to turn out a spy cost millions of dollars. Yeah, It's really expensive. And if you look at all the things that, and I can't tell you, but like, if you look at all the things that they train you in and the experts they have to bring in and all the stuff you like blow up, right? You know, or like have to do, you know, or places they have to rent out for training and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's so much money. So I knew that those two things combined in her head was like, this guy just got cleared hot and now he's threatening to quit which means we would have got nothing out of him yet. Mm -hmm. You know, our investment is a bust. So maybe I should take an extra 10 minutes out of my day and put him in this slot and give the other slot to the other guy, you know, just do a yeah. 180 on these. And 
it was so patently obvious that I was looking at her. You know how you look at, you know how your dog will look at you when it's confused, right? <laughs> you know, yeah, its head turns yeah. and it's like, why aren't you giving me that bone? You know, <laughs> so that's what I was doing with her. I was literally like chilling my head, like, yeah. how do you not get this? Yeah. How do you not get this? What is wrong with you? This is the simplest thing. And uh, <laughs> so she, uh, she was really mad at me and uh, she put it this way. She could have had me fired if she wanted to. She was a general equivalent, uh, like SIS one, we call them senior intelligence service one, two, and three, three is the highest. And, um, so she would have been called a cis one, which could melt you. And mm -hmm. uh, so I'm telling a cis one, it'd be like a newly minted guy who came out of West point going up to a general and going, yeah, I'm not doing that general. No chance. <laughs> <laughs> the general's going to go, guess where you're going. Oh, you know? yeah. You're going to yeah. be doing push-ups all day. So anyway, but, uh, yeah, I ended up, I, again, I think she just, it clicked like, okay, this guy's a rebel and I don't want him to quit. Cause it's going to be more of a pain in my ass to explain to my contemporaries why this mm -hmm. guy quit and we got nothing out of him. And I'll have to give that in my monthly report. If I just switch it, give him money once, damn it uh he'll go away <laughs> and so and that's what she did and then i did i went away and uh so yeah that's my it's my story of being it's, a brat and then a, getting labeled oops. difficult <laughs> <laughs> but you know those are, well i don't know i come from a mining town where you wish you had the moxie to stand up from to power you just yeah. you know and you appreciate people who do when you're right but i mean and at that point in your career they should have known who you were I mean, um, not that you were a brat, but that who, what you were, what you could do, where probably if you were asking to be sent there, that might be a good thing. I think they knew what my uh, capabilities were, but they didn't know who I was. I wore a mask uh -huh. until I got that Willy Wonka ticket. Uh -huh. Okay. I was not myself personality wise. And I talk about that in my book, how I was only myself with my friends I made in Georgetown socially. Mm -hmm you know, going out three or four nights a week to the bars. That's who I was as a human being. Yeah. When I went to the CIA, along with that suit, you know, there's a facade going over my personality of being, you know, uh, very uh, generic, very clinical, very synthetic, you know, mm -hmm. and um, just uh, not making jokes, not being funny, you know, just being just very, this is, this is what very sterile would be the uh, way to describe it. Very sterile, very packaged. Corporate. And, uh, so you could, corporate is a way to put it too, but like, but like plastic corporate, you know, like uh, not just corporate, uh, but like no personality corporate. And um, so, yes, sir. Got it, sir. Absolutely, sir. I'll have that to you right now, sir. I will make these files for you, sir. I will look that up for you, sir. Thank you, sir. You know, stuff like that sharp tie, you know, very nice yeah. fitting suit, clean shoes. And then I get home, I'm putting on like cut off sweat shorts, you know, like a, a t-shirt and a hat and flip flops and go into the bar, you know? <laughs> so it's like it's be a whole 180 of kind of how I lived otherwise. And um, so, yes, once I graduated the farm, that went out the window. I stopped wearing a tie to the agency, which mm -hmm. some of my bosses would be like, where's your tie? And I was like, <laughs> I don't want to wear one anymore. And they, they didn't know what to say to that yeah. because it's not the military. It's yeah. not, it's still a civilian organization. It's a federal agency, but I just go, I don't want to wear one. And then they have to go through the mental math too of like, how much is it worth for me to get into an argument with this guy about wearing a tie? It's not. Yeah. And then I had some pretty nice suits and um, the fashion uh, couture of the time was no belts. Uh, and um, so I stopped wearing a belt because I didn't need to. And uh, my boss said, where's your belt? You aren't wearing a belt today, are you wearing that? And I go, yeah, I'm wearing that. He goes, why aren't you wearing one? I said, because my pants fit. And he's <laughs> like, I, uh. you know, and then he yeah. has to again go like, do I get in a fight with this guy? I mean, he is wearing a suit, but no tie and no belt. Like, ah. Uh, yeah. 
ah, forget it. You know, <laughs> so they just kind of, yeah, it's not worth it. He'll be gone at a black site soon and we won't have to worry about him anymore. Yeah. But uh, I hated headquarters for sure. <laughs> I get that. I, I would understand mm-hmm. that. And mm-hmm. it, so, and at that point, after, after that fun story, uh, mm-hmm. you take the language class. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's Pashtun, Pashtun? Pashto. 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 And yeah. you go through that year and you're sent to Afghanistan. And mm-hmm. so when, when you get there, I mean, I just can't imagine all of the adjustments you had to make. And mm-hmm. did you, were you warned? Were you, that, you know, it's, there's the rat, there's living in the cell, there's, I mean, sure. it makes makes what we see in the movies look like a country club and <laughs> um and some you know and of the number of the places that you write about in the book uh it did was there somebody who said okay it's going to take you three days sleeping in a what was it a mm-hmm. shipping crate with rats a container before you can get to where you're supposed to go i mean was there was there somebody who could show you the ropes in that way no there was no one. And I mean, look, that's a big part of the training at the farm is to make you a lone wolf and to train you how to operate independent of everything and everyone to be a survivor. Right. And that's it. It's not like the military where you can rely on your unit and uh, hi puppy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he, he likes this part of the story. Uh-huh. Um, so uh yeah, they trained you though. So I was ready for it. I mean, it, put, put it this way, like, and this is why I always say I'm so grateful for the CIA because the farm is some of the most elite training of any institution in the world. Mm-hmm. It has to be, it has yeah. to be by its very nature to keep our country safe. And so that's why I said they spent so much money on you and I'm so grateful for that. Um, but in doing so, it makes you a, a pretty like, powerful person you know just mentally speaking I mean in that you can deal with anything Mm -hmm. like nothing is too much for you to handle yeah I'm not going to go do like advanced physics of course I don't understand it but like you can throw any type of trauma at me or drama and it doesn't it just rolls off my back it's not a problem so rats crawling on me I didn't enjoy it but it wasn't going to make me go cry and run home Mm -hmm. this was like oh man these rats suck (sighs) anyway you know so like that's how what I mean when I say um so no no one's there to show you because they don't have to what they have to do is say hey Doug you are going to xyz black site and you leave in 14 hours so be at the flight line uh in 12 hours And then you get to sit there on your backpack for two hours. And (laughs) and then we're going to weigh you in because they have to Mm -hmm. um, to make sure the helicopter doesn't crash. We're going to weigh you in and then uh, you're going to get on and you're going to go out. And then they're going to drop you off. And then you're going to walk into that base and there'll probably be a chief there. And, you know, however many case officers, maybe only one other one. And he'll say, hey, what's going on? So uh, uh, that's where you sit and uh, good luck. And that's it. Mm -hmm. So you sit down and you've never been there before and you don't get up and go, hey, um, chief, can you like, uh, you know, drive me around town tomorrow and like show me the ropes? No, you'd go do it. And you don't ask him, you know, he's like, what, me show you around? go drive around, figure it out. But Siri, you know, you've been here for a year. Could you maybe show me the hot spots and where not to go where, figure it out. And I mean, that is literally what it is. And uh, so, yeah, you go and you get some of your armed bodyguards and you say, hey guys, uh, I wanna go into town tomorrow. I know you guys know the uh, area. Um, So if you guys could drive me around, I just wanna go throughout the city and, you obviously know the bad spots. I need to go through those. So be prepared and be armed. And uh, what time do you guys want to leave? <laughs> you know, and yeah. they're like, eh, let's leave at like 9 a.m. Okay, I will see you at 830. And that's it. 
you figure it out. You do it yeah. yourself. You take yeah. the initiative. And so, yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> and so that must be where, well, I, I'm just going to change the subject a little bit. So when you're, sure. so you went into town and when you, they knew who you were. They knew you were government. They knew you introduced yourself. I think you say in the book that you were a government official or something of that. And then you decided to dress like them, but they knew who you were. Was that, what was in your mind, the reason to do that? So one of the biggest things that they'll teach you in the agency is called blending in, to blend in. Mm -hmm. And so my, I had what was called a two-fister beard, meaning two fists long. That's what the Afghans taught oh. me. That's what they call it, a two-fister. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I made my appearance look like them, and I actually tan very dark. Uh, I bought their local clothing from the local market. I started to dress like them. Yeah, I obviously could speak their language. But uh, if I even opened my mouth for one sentence, they would know immediately this guy's not from here that's mm -hmm. not how our voice is done okay that's mm -hmm. one the reason i dress like them is because two things one blending in i want to be able to get what's called the first pass meaning if i'm going through a checkpoint and maybe i'm with two afghans in the front seat and i'm in the back seat and somebody just looks into the car that's the first pass they assume I'm Afghan and they, they, we just roll through, right? Because I haven't mm -hmm. opened my mouth. Yeah. So I've used this example before. Like you think of a guy like Antonio Banderas, right? The famous actor. Uh -huh. If he's just sitting in the backseat of a car and he has a t-shirt on that says USA, right? And then like a camo American flag hat on. You as a cop looking in, seeing him, you're going to just assume he's an American. Mm -hmm. Probably. You're just, you're not going to assume... He's a Spaniard out the gate, right? You're not. But if you go to the second wave, now you're knocking on my window and you're wanting to talk to me. If you do that to Antonio Banderas and he opens his mouth, you know in his first sentence out of his mouth, this guy is from Europe. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know you know what I mean? Like he's yeah. got that sexy Spanish accent, you know? Uh -huh. You know immediately, this guy's not American, period, period. Yeah. And you know it as an American, nope. Nope. So for me, I, and I'm sure Antonio Banderas is fluent in English, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I was fluent in Pashtun. Doesn't matter. Your accent gives you away and yeah. they would know. So dressing like them, the first part is uh, to get past that first wave, that initial check, that little initial like, who's that? Oh, okay, he's Afghan. Go on. Uh, and B is to ingratiate myself to them. Mm -hmm. So speaking with them again, like with Antonio Banderas, like let's say he's on a military base at Fort Bragg, you know, talking to some senior brass and he's wearing a USA shirt and a camo hat with a American flag on it. They're going to love that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like the generals are going to be like, hey, hey, nice shirt, nice hat, you know, like, hey, that's yeah. pretty cool. Even if he doesn't believe in it or not. They're going to see that and go, hey, yeah, man, awesome hat. That's pretty rad. <laughs> yeah, I like this guy. I always knew I liked his movies, you know. But if he wears a Spanish soccer jersey and a hat that says Espana on it, they're probably going to be like, what's this guy? What the fuck is this? What is he doing? Mm -hmm. Like, what is this guy doing? Really? He's wearing Spanish shit on our base? Like, really? So, yes, it was to make them be like, hey, he's really trying. Yeah. You know, like we like this guy. So those were the reasons I dressed like them and it really paid dividends. And yeah. I still have some of that clothes. Really? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, sure. Uh, but did the other case officers who were there before you, did they dress? No one had. Okay. Um, I thought that's what I read in the book. Yeah, but but see also no one spoke Pashto. Ah. So um, that's just a cold hard fact that yeah. is embarrassing but it's reality and I won't sugarcoat it. Yeah. Cause at that time we had been there a 10 years, right? And the CIA probably <laughs> yeah. had to, at least 10 years. <laughs> well, what I always say is we've been at that point, we had been there one time 
we had been there one year, 10 times. That's what I say. We were there one year, 10 times. Because a guy like me, generally, you're there for one year and then uh-huh. you leave. And uh-huh. all your institutional knowledge leaves with you. Yeah. So now a fresh face comes in who's never been there and they're going to start right where I started. It's like Groundhog yeah. Day. Yeah. And, um, and so while you, were, while you were in Afghanistan, one of the last things you did before you left the agency was, well, while you were there, you figured out um, what your character called Wolverine was doing, what he was up to. Yes. And who he was yeah. doing it with. Mm-hmm. And you turned it over to uh, a colleague of yours to take care of. And so f- the work that you put in panned out, though they did eventually have to let him go. Yes. And uh, that, but yet, I think I heard you talk in an interview, you found out that the Wolverine disappeared or was killed. And, um, but what he was doing was he was made some sort of a, like a, I don't know what they call a factory or he figured out how to make IEDs. Yeah. Yeah. Basically he would tailor make IEDs based on who his buyer was. So, you know, it would be Taliban commander knows that U.S. military is driving up and down this highway at this time via this route, you know, on this day, every day of the month. And he knows if he puts a bomb there, pressure plate ID is what he needs. Okay. So he would just go to the Wolverine and say, hey, can you construct me a pressure plate ID? Um, It needs to have enough power to um, blow up an MRAP which is a big, heavily armored vehicle. Mm -hmm. And so the Wolverine knew all about explosives and he'd be like, oh, well, yeah, you're going to need a lot. Uh, So, you know, I will make that for you, but because it's so much explosives, this is what it's going to cost. So you need to get me that amount of money and then I'll make it for you. And that's how it would work. And then, you know, Joe Blow Taliban would uh, go round up the money, usually from his opium, proceeds and um, then go back to the Wolverine, pay him. Wolverine would have his kids, and I mean like children, yeah. not his children, but like children in the madrasa, mm-hmm. uh, which is a church for Islam, a uh, school. And uh, he'd have them constructed in the back of the madrasa and um, they'd make this big ass bomb. And then when it was done, he'd call the guy, he'd come pick it up. And then it was on that guy and his cronies to and place it on the road. Um, usually the night before the military convoy would be going by. And my God, if you ever want to be shocked, go ahead and type in like ID into YouTube. You'll see some nasty yeah. big explosions that completely yeah. erupt the road. Like it will like cause a crater. And if you've never seen a crater happen like <laughs> up close, it's a scary thing, you know? Uh-huh. So yeah, but that's... That was the scenario, and people found it very hard to believe, and uh, we eventually got him arrested, but like you said, he got released, and uh, I don't know what happened to him, so again, as I've said many times, hey, CIA lawyers, please do not write me a letter and sue me. (laughs) I have never said that he was killed. I don't know. I said Uh, I presumed. I presume he was killed. I presume, and the reason I presume is because why the hell would you want Oh, him yeah. walking around when he knows too much yeah. so either he's in a prison somewhere uh you know growing a long beard never to be released and we don't know about it or he they, the easiest thing to do in countries like that is just to shoot him in the back of the head so it's yeah my interpretation happened. my interpretation of what i thought i heard <laughs> on <laughs> <Yeah>. another interview <laughs> yeah. i presume that's what happened i don't know yeah. i don't i do not know it wouldn't be the first time I misspoke. That's <laughs> no, fine. <laughs> Won't I be just, the last. <laughs> no, it's fine. I just, it, it's also like when people say, well, when you were in Syria and I go, excuse me, I never said I was inside Syria. I've never said that. I said, I worked for the Syrian task force yeah. against Syria in yeah. the Middle East. I never said I was in that country. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We can assume, but we might assume wrong or right. You I don't might. know. You might. Yeah, you know, but I mean, and talking about those IEDs, I mean, you sourced a couple of pictures in your book of some of those bombings, and they are just oh, shocking. Yeah. It yeah, is on the shocking. Back of my book, you can oh. look at those mortars; yeah. they're huge. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, it's it is 
it's awful. And I, and I wanted to talk about that because that was something that you put a lot of work into and yeah. uh, cross our fingers. Um, <laughs> hopefully he didn't deliver his knowledge to somebody else. Who knows if they <laughs> probably, but mm-hmm. um, that's my cynicism. And But all of that, all of those years, and even with the, the Syrian task force that you served on, that took, it took a huge toll on you. Yeah. Absolutely. More so than in a typical job. Well, yeah. The, the, the hardest part, look, you be, the farm before you even deploy makes you fearless. Okay. Because it's really hard. It's yeah. really, 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 really hard. Yeah. And that's why buds for the seals has to be so hard and punishing. Yeah. And those drill instructors love you, but they're going to treat you like the worst like lucifer okay you know they're going to destroy you and um that's kind of how the farm is too Mm -hmm. they're going to bust you up and down so that you're hard when you come out of there okay and they know you can deal with the worst of the worst um and uh so the hardest part then was not the job it was the living your cover they call it yeah. so lying to my loved ones constantly because it's who you become as a person it's not just a job it's a lifestyle and um you know obviously there's various people who for whatever reason are living a lie you know whether it's because you have a second family or maybe um you're a homosexual I'm sure that's extraordinarily difficult, you know, to, mm-hmm. to, as they say, live in the closet, you know, yeah. like, yeah. I'm sure that's excruciatingly painful because kind of, I did something close to that, you know, like <laughs> my career was in the closet, yeah, you know, and I could not tell anybody legally. And it wasn't just because I thought it would be painful legally. I couldn't tell anybody. And so, uh, that was the hardest part. Um, because you know, this, if you've, had a significant other, um, when you catch them in a lie, mm-hmm. and the worst is when you catch them not in the big lie, but in a petty lie. And when you catch them in the petty lie, that's when you really get worried. Cause you're like, wow, why would he lie to me about that? Mm-hmm. Like, are you cheating on me? Cause that's what every female I dated immediately jumped to. Yeah. Because why would you not? Cause like, I'm a, I would lie about something like, hey, I'm going to a CVS. I'll be gone for 30 minutes. But I don't go to CVS. I go to meet with another guy from the agency because he needs to give me a thumb drive. And it's got some dumb document that it's not even important, but I need it to be able to fill out some form on my laptop, my agency laptop or whatever. You know, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And she might have followed me, you know, and then you didn't go to CVS. I know you didn't go to CVS because I went to CVS and you weren't in there. Oh, yeah, um, you're right. I didn't go to CVS, you know? And then it's uh-huh. like, why did you make that up? Where'd you really go? You can't tell her what you really know. No. So then what do you do, you know? And so now you have that in your face. Like, <laughs> why do you have these books in your apartment with all these squiggly languages on them? which would have looked like it would be the Arabic script, which is what Pashu is written in. Why do you have these? Oh, those, uh, just teaching myself a new language, huh? Yeah. You know, like why, who the hell does that? You know, well, what is this? You know, it's Pashtu. Why are you learning that language? I don't even know what it is. Um, because it seems cool. It's not cool, Doug. Yeah. Why? you know, are you a terrorist? Are you a bomb maker? Like there are bombs. These are bomb manuals. Why do you have bomb manuals? Uh, I just was interested in that kind of stuff. No one's interested in this kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Like that was the, always the kick in the shins that was really hard to deal with. Well, especially at that time in our country, people couldn't, (laughs) you know, you couldn't um, blame them for thinking what they thought. No, of course not. And uh, yeah, that must have been some, I mean, it, it, lying does take a toll on you, especially if you want to be a truthful person, if that's something, yeah. a quality that you admire or like in others, but telling your parents must have been an uncomfortable conversation. That happened uh, like four days before my book came out. <laughs> huh. 
So <laughs> they they had like a four day window, yeah. and then the whole world knew. So they didn't have much time to prepare for that. Um, yeah, I mean, that was very tough. Um, telling, you know, some of the people closest to me, I only told a handful of people, and I told them like two days before the book came out. Yeah. And uh, I, I actually went to tell my parents in person and drove home yeah. to tell them. But, uh, you know, it was that was hard for my mom because she just couldn't fathom. And she only knew a tenth of a percent of it because she hadn't read the book. Mm-hmm. And so I, I tried preparing them, telling them like, hey, I lived undercover. I was here. I was here. I just want you to know that I'll get you a copy of the book. Um it's not out yet, but yeah. your people are going to know because I'm going to go on to NBC and I'm going to go on to Fox and CNN. People are going to know that I was working against ISIS and that was a big hot button back then. Yeah. And like people are going to know that I used to work against the Taliban and Al Qaeda. So you're going to hear those things. Mm-hmm. And I just want you to be prepared for that. And uh, <laughs> for my mom, she just, even though I wasn't doing it anymore, it's kind of like hearing your son go, yeah, I used to be a heroin addict or something, you know, like Mm -hmm. they're not going to want to hear that. They're going to go, oh my God, you were, how did we not know? I feel so bad. So for her, she just was very upset that, uh, you know, I had not told her, but my dad, you know, he's a military guy and he was, you know, like, I think it's awesome, you know, like that's so cool, you know, but my mom's really cool too. And, you know, she was super strong about it and she's awesome. And she was like, you know, I think it's great, but um, yeah, I can see how at first she, she did not like hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't blame her. Hey mom, and- I've been lying to your face for 10 years. Thanks. Oh, but it was, you know, for a good reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As children sorry. think. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh, uh, but since then you wrote the book, and that's what we've been talking mm-hmm. about. But you've done a lot of other fun things, and mm-hmm. uh, you've done a few podcasts, and I'm kind of like those. You've done three. Okay. You've done mm-hmm. Right of Boom. We're still there, and Mark Core Radio. Mm-hmm. And how did you get into that? How did you get into podcasting and and music? So, uh, well, the podcasting I did because my, um, my representation, the agency that represents me for like TV and stuff like that, they also were like, hey, um, we've heard you on other people's podcasts. You do a pretty decent job. Uh, you would probably make a pretty good host. Uh, why don't you give us some like sample work? And so I was like, why don't I just make some podcasts for you? Like, forget yeah. a sample. I'll just do some entire episodes yeah so that's how uh right of boom and we're still there came about they're really kind of just billboards for me you know like a portfolio for them to shop around Uh, so i haven't really put anything into it for the past year or two um marco radio i work on pretty diligently at least one to two episodes a month um (laughs) believe it or not kind of weird my friends always laugh about this my biggest fan base is in taipei taiwan and i don't and i don't know why and i do not know why and uh the second biggest amount of listeners i have is in this uh city called Tallinn, estonia and i don't know why i mean i guess it's just like here in the united states things go viral yeah and so in those two cities very far apart and very far away from the united states my music has gone viral and I don't know why, but they like me and I can see how many people are downloading it, Uh you know? And so Taipei is like, I don't know, like hundreds of thousands of people every month download an episode, you know? And so, I mean, yeah, it's not in the millions, but that's the top 1% of of podcasts. (laughs) Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. And I got like a message uh i think last year that said i was in the top 50 in my genre on itunes and so i was like oh that's cool thanks taipei so (laughs) i don't know why there's no rhyme or reason but 
I like that type of electronic kind of laid back. It's called progressive house. I like that kind of music. It's what I already listen to. And um, so it's a radio station. Like I don't make, I don't write that music basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like yeah. it's other people's songs. I always give them credit always um, for using their music. And um, yeah, it's just like whenever I hear a song that I like, I write it down and I'm like, I'm going to put that on my radio station this month. And then once I have a assemblage of maybe five or six songs, I uh, will cut a, uh, an episode. So I think I have like 204 wow. episodes yeah. now. And um, it's, I enjoy doing it, put it that way. So it's kind of like my hobby, but it makes me some money. So yeah, I, that's a good thing. It's, it's worth doing it. Yeah. Anyway, you can during COVID while everything's yeah. locked down. But yep. tell us a little bit about uh, Civil Servant, your organization. Civil Servant is a um, nonprofit 501c3 that I run. Um, it's based in Ohio. And uh, I started that uh, right before COVID. So like November of 2019. And I got it all cleared with the state and mm -hmm. certified. And that was a bear. Cause I did it all myself. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so a lot of paperwork for that one. And uh, basically what I do is um, for local veterans uh, in the local community, because a lot of people join the military from where I'm from. Mm -hmm. uh, and so whenever those kids come home for an R and R or to get out of the military, I try to go to the local uh, restaurants and stuff. And, um, you know, buy them a, uh, a gift certificate or a gift card and, uh, you know, just try to do some things for them. I support a uh, wonderful organization uh, also from this community. It's called Thanks to Our Yanks. Um, and I help them whenever I can. They kind of do something very similar. And so we kind of team up and um, basically it's for the local people here you know i'm not yeah. sending stuff out to guys in new yeah. york because i'm a small time one man operation as mm -hmm. of now so um but yeah that's just something i do to kind of stay connected to my old life and um you know it's because i know what it's like to be over there and it sucks yeah. and so when you come back the number one thing and sometimes it's hard for both sides of the stick to deal with meaning when you come back from a deployment, you just want everything to be like it was when you left it. You mm -hmm. know, you just, you want everyone to have like been put on pause. <laughs> well, guess yeah. what? Mm -hmm. People don't put themselves on pause and they want you to be just like you were when you left. Well, guess what? You definitely aren't like you were when you, before you left. Yeah. You are a different human being when you come back. And so both parties have a hard time Mm -hmm. like adjusting to each other because both of you mm -hmm. are so different yeah and um so i try to help in that regard too and meet up with the soldiers because i can speak their language yeah and they can tell me what they're feeling and you know what what they're all about and what they did because they know i've done it and mm -hmm. um so i just try to be supportive and that's what civil servant does that's 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 pretty that's pretty cool that's pretty awesome and uh, just a couple more easy questions. What are you passionate about? <laughs> <laughs> what am I passionate about? Yeah. Uh, my, my cat Bubbins. That would yeah. be number one on my list always. Uh -huh. uh, so the bubs say. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, I was hoping he would come up. I read about him. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Bubbins. That's my bye-bye. Um, yeah. Look, I mean, you probably, you mentioned it at the top of the show. I have gone Hollywood as a lot of my <laughs> former agency guys like to make fun of me. Um, so I, I, am I passionate about it? I don't know. I enjoy it. Um, I like doing TV things, whether it's writing the show yeah. or being on the show. Um, I really enjoyed doing that thing. Spy games. It was fun. Yeah. Um, and I really liked the uh, fellow hosts. They've become some of my best friends. Uh, so I hope that there's a second season for that. I would be passionate about that simply because, uh, 
the fellow hosts are really, I'm very close with them now. In fact, I just sent them Christmas cards yesterday. Right. <laughs> so like that's, uh -huh. they're very good friends of mine. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I would be passionate about that. Uh, otherwise, um, I'm trying to write another book. Will it come to fruition? Look, the literary world's tough. You know, yeah. it was really hard to get my first book out. It's easier to get on TV than it is to get a book published. Self-publish? So, Self-publish it? Oh, no. I, no? I, mean, I would definitely want to do it with a publisher because I, I want it to be on Amazon, you know, like as a hard book that you can buy. If I self-publish it, then it's only digital. I'd like to read what you have coming, coming up. Is it the same kind of genre or is it something totally different? Oh, man, it is so completely different. Yeah. Um, it has to do with um, art thievery. Mm. <laughs> I bet you didn't see that coming. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it has to do with stolen art, oh. stolen masterpieces that are still stolen. And I looked into it. Yeah. And it's basically my investigation and me going around wow. investigating it and writing about it. And see, he likes yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Talk about <laughs> He's a like, cow. I want to read oh that. I am. I want to read that. He loves it. <laughs> there you go. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun and interesting. It's my genre. I do read a lot of that kind of stuff. So, yes, I will be reading that, too. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. And, um, well, we're running out of time here, but we talked about a lot of everything that I wanted to talk to. We even got bum and say my sister would have said something had I not talked about your cat. <laughs> you being a cat person. I'm a cat. Per I'm so the cat person. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for, for being on the show today, Doug. I, I so appreciate it. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, well, I'm looking forward to what you come, what comes next. Yeah. And, uh, you know, look, like I said, um, I always am appreciative of people who took the time to read something I wrote or watch something I, you know, published out there and, you know, it's very humbling. Um, and to, too non often, very, very often people haven't even, they don't even know how to pronounce my last name. They don't, you know, take the time to even watch a five minute video about me on YouTube that would tell you everything. And so the fact that you read my book and, uh, you know, even know about my, um, my nonprofit uh, means a lot. And so I appreciate it. And I'm happy that I did this. And I thank you for having me as a guest. Oh, you're so very welcome. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure. And uh, thanks for putting up with my dogs. <laughs> yeah, that's, fine. that's totally fine. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. The We as Citizens podcast, because conversation matters.